So well, I'd like to um, introduce our speaker today, which is a, a, a member of the geography department, That's right, as well as the US Geological Survey, wearing two hats, which is neat, and oversees the palynology lab, which is even more wonderful, David Wall. And he is also a member of our, I don't know what your title is, but you're part of our open group. Um, and so today, he's going to be presenting some of his current research that he is doing in uh, Mesoamerica, uh, in the Mile Lowlands, as the title says. And he's going to be telling us about climate and land use change in the Mile Lowlands, I'm assuming in the past. That's right. <laughs> Good. OK, well, welcome, Dave. And thank you so much for starting our career off. All right. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, thank you guys all for coming out. Um, as Christine said, I've been doing some work uh, in the Mayo Lowlands uh, going on about 20 years now. And so I'm actually really excited to take uh, this opportunity to, to step back and kind of synthesize the, the work that I've been doing um, at looking at environmental change, climate change, uh, pretty much throughout the Holocene, but really kind of focusing in on questions that revolve around uh, cultural trajectory uh, in, the, in the Maya region, in the Mayo Lowlands. Um, and so what I'm going to do is basically start off with a background of the Maya Lowlands, kind of the physical components of it, uh, touch on some of the cultural history and the archaeology of the areas that I've been working on. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go a little bit through the field work techniques and, and lab methods that we use and then get into the data. Um, and I'm actually going to wrap up with uh, a very new, uh, pretty exciting find that we have that uh, looks like we might be able to link the sediment record to um, a warfare event and the epigraphic record, which is kind of a first of its kind, um, certainly in the New World, linking written record to uh, changing environments. So before I get started, I just want to kind of point out this is definitely a multi-institutional, uh, multi-collaborative um, uh, effort. Um, Roger Byrne, I'd like to just give a nod to. He passed away, unfortunately, in March. Uh, was really critical in, in uh, my development of interest in prehistoric agriculture and environmental change in Mesoamerica. Uh, other than that, working with a, a lot of different folks, archaeologists, Richard Hansen is the director of the Mirador Project, Francisco Stradabelli, uh, director of the Whole Mole Project, and a whole list of folks that have uh, contributed data, contributed time and effort to uh, what I'm going to be showing you guys today. Okay, so this uh, map here, just to really quickly situate ourselves uh, geographically, the, the Maya Lowlands essentially is, is all of the area of this map of the Yucatan Peninsula that, that's off of this volcanic axis to the south here. Um, and the Yucatan Peninsula is this very large uh, tertiary limestone platform that uplifted. Um, and it's really dominated, aside from the granitic intrusion here of the Maya Mountains, it's dominated by karst topography, so this limestone um, topography. And that, that really means two things for the, the point of this talk. One is uh, uh, water bodies are, are really, and surface water is pretty scarce, right? You have this limestone, it's very porous rock, a lot of the water percolates through. Um, so you don't have a lot of lakes and you don't have a lot of rivers. So there's a lot of subterranean rivers um, and there's sinkholes and cenotes uh, and lakes are, uh, are, are not so common up in the, in the heart of the karst platform here. And so basically what that draws to mind are two things. One is the possibility of water shortages and drought in the past affecting the Maya, which I'll touch on. Uh, and the other is in terms of my work, I'm looking for permanent standing bodies of water. So um, in a sense, it's kind of catch as catch can. It's not like you can just go down and find a spot right next to a, you know, a site that you're interested in exploring the history of and, and just start coring. Um, Precipitation is highly seasonal today. So there's essentially a six month drought every year down here. So we get a big wet season from late May, early June, uh, through to sometime in November. Um, and then it really kind of shuts off. And there, you know, there's some winter rain that can, can kind of come through from the, the northern latitudes, but um, you really get a, a very stark dry season down here. If you've ever been out there in the dry season, uh, water procurement uh, can be an issue when you're not uh, in, in a town. Um, and it's also, there's a, a very steep precipitation gradient. So down in the southern part of the peninsula, we get about two and a half meters of rain during that, during that wet period. It's very wet, very moist, uh, and it drops off as one moves up towards the, the northwest corner here is the, really the driest part. It can drop as low as you know, 500 millimeters a year, which is barely enough uh, to support rain-fed agriculture. 
Along that precipitation gradient, we see a vegetation gradient. So in the south, we've got big, high, closed canopy, tropical evergreen forest. And as one moves north, we move out of that. Height of the canopy comes down, starts opening it up, opening up a bit, uh, get more of an understory. You start seeing a lot of deciduousness uh, on the big forest trees. They drop their leaves in the dry season, um, likely a pollination strategy. They flower also when the leaves are dropped. Um, and then that just grades down. The canopy comes down as one moves north, and it finally up in the northern part of the peninsula, it's this leguminous thorn scrub. It's really just kind of an open, very low canopy, maybe 10, 15 feet, um, lots of undergrowth, lots of scrubby vegetation. Okay, so zooming in on the, on the, the center part of that, here we're looking at the, uh, the northern part of Guatemala, the Paten district. And this is where I've been doing all my work. And I'm just going to kind of tee off by talking about this area that's up here in the very north central part of Paten. It's known as the Mirador Basin. Um, it's not really a basin. I'm not going to get into that right now. But uh, it's a very uh, important area in terms of early Maya development. And it's a really incredible area. It's about 2,200 square kilometers of roadless wilderness. So uh, Richard Hansen has been doing his best to try to uh, keep this uh, kind of un- um, impacted, uh, it's part of the Maya Biosphere Reserve. Um, but importantly, out within this area, there are uh, a number of very large, very early Mayan sites. So these sites labeled, listed here are all uh, pre-classic sites. Um, they, they date to the uh, pretty much the, the, the initial settlement can, can show up in the middle pre-classic, but really kind of had their boom in the late pre-classic. Um, and the namesake site for the Mirador Basin is El Mirador, and it's really an incredible uh, place. It's very large. This is a, an artist's reconstruction. Terry Rutledge drew this for National Geographic. Um, just kind of giving an idea of the scale. Um, I should point out that uh, Knock Bay is about 12 kilometers away. Uh, the recently, there's been a big effort to fly LIDAR down in the Maya Lowlands, and it's just been an absolute game changer. It's incredible. It's basically the last couple of decades, the total station mapping is, you know, the further they'd push out into the forest, it was just settlement all the way. If it went, if, if people were not down in a marsh or in a wetland doing the mapping, there were structures everywhere. And so now the LIDAR is showing that, you know, it looks like El Mirador and Knock Bay were likely connected. I mean, there are causeways that connect them, but now we're just seeing continuous settlement and it's massive. Um, and El Mirador has very large structures. This pyramid right here is called El Tigre. Um, this one in the background is Ledanta. Um, it's only about 70 meters high, but it's uh, uh, the, arguably the largest pyramid in the world in terms of cubic meters of fill. So 2,800,000 cubic meters of fill. Um, you know, you basically go up the first platform and walk another 10 minutes and then go up the second platform another five minutes. It's just, it's incredibly large. Um, so just to kind of hit on that point some more. So Tigre, which I showed, is the second largest pyramid at, at El Mirador. If you were to pick up El Tigre and drop it in downtown Tikal, it would basically cover the, the Great Plaza and the entire North Acropolis. So this is one pyramid at El Mirador uh, for comparison with kind of the downtown region of, of this classic period site of Tikal. So again, here's Mirador in its heyday around uh, AD 100, late pre-classic. Uh, everything's going fine, and this is what El Mirador looks like today, right? So we've got Ledanta off in the background. Here's a El Tigre, and there's Los Monos, another pyramid there, um, which that kind of stark contrast kind of raises this question, which I think pretty much anyone going far back in time who's ever wandered into one of these sites asks themselves, what happened? You know, what is, what is going on here? Uh, what happened to the people who lived here? And so... Um, there are a number of different collapse theories. I have collapse in quotes because it implies uh, I don't know, a rapidity that I don't think we have constrained in terms of the rate at which places were abandoned. Uh, it's something that I've actually tried to do some work on and get at. Um, but we do know there was widespread abandonment. There was widespread abandonment at the uh, end of the Classic period. Um, and it looks like there were abandonments prior to that at the end of the Late Classic, uh, possibly before. And so I've kind of broken these collapse theories out into two main categories here. You can think of non-environmental ones. Uh, I, I do want to say this before I push forward. It's pretty easy to see that these are intertwined, right? Like we're not going to pull one of these out uh, and say this is the, the, um, uh, the singular cause or even the primary cause. We can look at warfare and that's going to be linked to collapse of trade routes. You can have warfare increase because of climate variability. 
Um, there's there's a, a, an, an interwoven uh, connection between all of these theories. Uh, but what, here we have them. You know, these are kind of the major ideas around what may have caused this abandonment in the southern Maya lowland. Warfare is a very uh, prominent theory. You know, there's a lot of evidence. Arthur Demares has done a lot of work down in the Patesh Batun region showing uh, increased warfare, um, increased frequency, intensity of warfare during the terminal classic period. Um, it's not entirely clear uh, how much is inner polity versus revolt. You know, there's some kind of scapegoat king models where the peasants may be rising up because they're unhappy with, um, you know, the king has pitched himself as having a connection to the gods, and then, oh, there's a drought, um, and people might uh, uh, throw, overthrow the, uh, the elites. Um, but there is plenty of evidence for, for warfare. We have drawings of it. We have um, epigraphy. We have war statements. There are several war statements, burning, chopping, um, entering the cities. Um, um, but other than uh, that, and there's evidence of fortifications. There's not a lot of firm archaeological evidence for what warfare meant on the ground. And I'm going to loop back to this uh, as I kind of close out the talk. Uh, other theories here, collapse of trade routes, which again could be linked to warfare. A lot of the trade routes were likely um, on waterways. So again, if we have climatic variability, things are getting drier, that could, could feed into that. Uh, overpopulation, I'm, I'm not even going to get into. Um, environmental change, so climate variability, drought, uh, I'll be talking about this. There's kind of a prominent theory that um, multi-decadal droughts during the terminal classic period may have played a role in the trajectories down here. Uh, environmental degradation, uh, another one. Uh, and finally, disease is, a, is a, a compelling idea. There's very little evidence, no evidence for it, but it's, it, it's a, a mechanism that would explain widespread abandonment across the kind of geographic scales we're talking about. Um, again, some of these are easier to test, these hypotheses, than others. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm working on uh, lake sediment cores that, that can get it, uh, you know, a lot of these environmental questions here in terms of climate variability, environmental change. Um, and so if I kind of frame the research questions that I'm working under. Uh, one of them would be, uh, what's the occupational slash agricultural history of this region? So with the lake sediment cores, we have a lot of preservation of materials, of fossil materials, different chemical signatures um, that can do much to augment the archaeological record. You know, we're in the humid tropics here. There's not a lot of cultural material preserved. Um, we're um, able to, to if, if we can link a, a, a sediment sequence to a site or to an area, it can, it can actually add a lot, especially deeper in time. So I put the slash agricultural here because uh, we're able to, to actually look at agricultural activity pretty clearly in the sediment record. Uh, and so we can look at settlement uh, and abandonment through this lens of uh, evidence of nearby agricultural history or activity. Uh, what were the environmental impacts of pre-Hispanic settlement? So again, looking at this notion of environmental degradation, what can we say about when we know people are here, what, what, what do we see happening on the landscape, um, and what can we say about that? Uh, and then finally, looking at these drought hypotheses, is there any evidence uh, for climate variability associated with periods where we see demographic decline or population transitions uh, near the sites that we're working at? Okay, so here's the Yucatan Peninsula again. And so in order to answer those questions, what I've done is basically set out to create a network of sites across the southern Maya lowland. So these are, these are all published records. We have uh, a handful of other cores in the, in the coolers down in Menlo Park. Uh, and we also have uh, other sites targeted for, for future work. But the idea here is, um, you know, the Maya lowlands are a pretty heterogeneous environment, and uh, by creating a network of sites, we're able to kind of parse out what might be a local signal from a more regional signal. So when we see kind of coherence in the, in the transitions of these records across a, a bigger geographic space, we can say more about regional processes uh, than, than local ones. And so um, these are all kind of uh, acronyms for the, these Lakes that we're working on, this is Lago Puerto Arturo, this is Lago Pashban, Aguada Zacatal, uh, Laguna Eknob, and Laguna Yaloch. Um, and I've also highlighted some other very well dated, uh, good paleoclimate records, the locations of these sites uh, on this map as well. So this is a speleothem from Tsabna. This is uh, Lake Chichan Kanab, uh, which was kind of the, the original um, lake sediment core that, that pushed the drought hypothesis forward. Um, Punta Laguna, another lake sediment core, um, all of these notably coming from the northern Maya lowlands. 
And then we have a speleothema uh, from down here in southern Belize, um, Yak Bolam, that has, again, a very well-dated sequence that, that we're going to look at as we move forward here. Okay, so in terms of doing the field work, it's always exciting. A lot of you uh, may have experiences like this, but we basically bring all our gear down to uh, a small town, pile it all into the back of a pickup truck until it's overflowing, and then pile you know, eight grown men into the back for a two to four hour ride on a dirt road, which uh, is always quite exhilarating. Um, usually they're in the wet season, so we push our way through uh, the mud. A um, lot more fun when you get to drive. Um, this, this always cracks me up. So you break down out there. So we snapped our leaf springs, and these guys, it took us five minutes to be back on the road. Just went out in the jungle, carved off a stick, lifted the truck up, propped it in there, and we move on. You know, there's no, no stopping the train when you're, when you're that far out there. Uh, so the end of the road is usually a very small village. Uh, we get out here, in, the, in this case, it's Carmelita, um, and that's where phase two starts. We get all the equipment loaded onto uh, mules and push off uh, for another 40-mile walk um, through the forest. Uh, again, it's the wet season, so we're often um, basically wading through water in the low-lying areas. Um, but we're aiming for the field camp, which again, a lot of you guys probably have experience with these types of field camps. Um, they're uh, pretty significant production. So in the case of Hansen's group out at Mirador, he's often uh, hosting two to 300 people out there for two to three months. It's a big operation. It's very remote. Um, and this is basically civilization when, when, when we're out there. You know, there's a lab set up. We've got the kitchen, our little camp zone for the, for the summer. Uh, but as I mentioned, the lakes are kind of few and far between. So this is base camp for me. We basically put the gear back on the horses and then get the machetes out and push another you know, day or three uh, further out to get to the lakes. Um, carrying our coring platform, which uh, I've named the Fitzcarraldo. Um, everything breaks down and fits on, fits on the mules. Um, get that constructed, get it out and anchored into a lake. Um, it's pretty common to find old mahogany dugout canoes tucked in the reeds, which we take advantage of uh, if we can find them. Um, and so then our coring itself is done with a Livingston piston core. So it's all hand-operated equipment. It's not mechanized. Um, we always use plastic liner tubes to kind of maintain the integrity of the cores to get them out of the jungle and back to the lab. Um, but we basically load the barrel up and just push it down into the mud. The clay is pretty stiff in Patan, so sometimes it takes you know, a fair amount of pushing um, <laughs> to, uh, to get a good 40 centimeter section. <laughs> um, so, but at the end of the day, if all goes well, you've pushed through the entire sediment sequence. Uh, in this case, we have seven meters of mud. Here's the sediment water interface showing nice, clear, nice and clear there. Um, seven meters down and then a replicate core that basically catches the, the junctions of each of these sections. So we have complete recovery going all the way down. Um, then we get them back to the lab and we do um, essentially uh, as many different analyses as we can on the, on the core. So a big one that we, we use, uh, Christine mentioned that we have the pollen lab over in geography, is pollen analysis, reconstruct the vegetation, uh, mostly in the watershed uh, nearby the lake. Um, we can enumerate charcoal fragments and, and reconstruct fire histories um, and, and uh, see how that uh, interplays with the vegetation history. Uh, we look at physical properties. We look at what the sediment is composed of. Like here we have these carbonate bands that are interbedded with organic rich material. Uh, we do these analyses to kind of parse out how much clay is in the core, how much organic material. Um, magnetic susceptibility is a proxy for erosion. So it's uh, terrigenous material coming into the lake has its own magnetic signature. Um, we do stable isotope analysis on uh, organic matter to look at what types of plants we're growing in and around the lake. Um, we also do analyses on carbonate to look at uh, uh, hydroclimate variability in the past. And age control is provided by radiometric dating. So we do lead 210 on the surface uh, sediments uh, and a lot of radiocarbon dating. And this is, this is something that we've really been emphasizing and pushing forward a lot on um, uh, the need for very uh, high resolution and accurate age control and age depth modeling. So there's some nice statistical packages that have come out uh, recently, Clam and Bacon, and more recently one called Plum, uh, where you can put in your radiocarbon ages and get um, the, the distribution, the probabilities of an age really kind of constrained because uh, you're able to add in some more variables um, uh, as, in terms of where those samples came from. 
Um, and then we you know, always do high resolution digital photography uh, and x-rays to just get a nice archive of the records of the sediment material. Okay, so I just want to say one thing about zeopollen before I uh, push forward into the data. Zeopollen is an incredibly important tool for us because of uh, some characteristics that it, it has. One is um, once you move out of the, the highlands in Mexico and western Guatemala uh, where Teosinte currently grows, uh, we, we don't have any zea growing in the wild down in the lowlands here in, in Guatemala. It's a, it's a completely domesticated plant, um, corn is anyway, um, and it has to be planted to grow. So it's not growing in the wild. And importantly, it's identifiable down to the species level. So most pollen taxa, unfortunately, especially in the tropics, you can only get down to the family level, uh, which causes some lack of resolution in terms of our ability to interpret what those pollen types uh, can tell us. Um, and yet uh, others can go down to the generic level, but here we have this ability because zea um, has been selected for so long, um, the corn pollen itself is really um, dramatically different than other grass pollen. And so there's a number of characteristics that allow us to identify it. It doesn't travel very far from the parent plant. So all of those combined means that when you see zea pollen in the, in the sediment, we know we have a very clear indicator of nearby agriculture. People are there, they're planting corn, uh, and, it's, and it's nearby. And so that's a very powerful tool that we've used in terms of trying to reconstruct, as I mentioned earlier, these agricultural and settlement histories. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to show this, uh, uh, this lake here. Is, I'm going to be showing a lot of data from Lago Puerto Arturo. It's a, it's a kind of a mid-sized lake. It's about one and a half square kilometers, this crescent shape of a very deep water um, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I was a little alarmed to see the clandestine airstrip near it after I got out from the jungle, but uh, um, nonetheless, uh, it's got a very shallow, whole, the whole center area, uh, likely a delta that formed through its, its history that's just dominated by emergent sedges, and that's going to come into the story in a, in a little bit. It also has an island on it that was just rife with classic period artifacts and tipped over stele. Um, but uh, this, is, this is a site that has a record that goes back about uh, 8,700 years. So we've got a kind of a pre-settlement, pre-agricultural run-up to the, the transitions that we see. All right, so turning to the data here, um, what we've got here are the pollen, pollen curves. Uh, I've got these two profiles here grouped together represent um, several of those families I mentioned uh, that together represent high forests, the forest taxa. Uh, we have grasses. Weedy taxa is the uh, kenopods and, uh, and asters, you know, mostly agricultural weeds. Um, anytime there's a white inlay in that, that's ambrosia, ragweed, which is a very common agricultural weed. Um, and over here we have uh, uh, the corn pollen. Now, I'm starting this, uh, I truncated this. So this record goes back, as I mentioned, to 8,700 years. And what we see over and over again in this area um, is coming out of the, the glacial period, um, probably around 11,000 years ago, the forests moved in and dominated. So from, from this point down, we really have a domination of, of high forest uh, in all of the records, not that there's that many, that actually go back through the entire Holocene. But what we see is starting around 5,000 years ago, we start seeing a decrease in forest taxa. Um, and there's a big debate as to whether that was driven by climate change, things getting drier, or the initial arrival of, uh, of people and agriculturalists. Um, and that's a whole other seminar to dive into the, the data on that. Um, but what we can look at here is starting around 4,600 or so years ago, we have our first uh, corn pollen showing up in the record. Um, and along with that, we start seeing, at least with this group of families of forest species, uh, a, a decrease, a, a long, slow decrease heading up into uh, the, the middle part of the early pre-classic. Um, and so this is kind of the initial evidence of, of folks moving into the area, predating um, settlement at Knock Bay, which is the oldest settlement we have up in the Mirador area. Um, and then starting uh, shortly after 3,500 years ago, uh, we get really kind of more consistent presence of, uh, of corn, and we see this very stark and clear decrease in forest taxa through this period. Uh, and it's coupled with this increase in grasses and increase in weedy taxa. And this inverse relationship between agricultural weeds uh, and, and evidence of an open environment, disturbed environment with closed canopy forest taxa um, is, is something we can think of as an ecological signature for, for settlement. 
Uh, and conversely, when it all reverses here, we can see it as an ecological signature of abandonment. And so what we've got here is basically a 2,500 year record of uh, settlement uh, around Lago Puerto Arturo. One unknown right now with, with tropical palynology and palynology in general, we don't really know how regional this record is. We don't know how far out from the lake we can actually extrapolate these, uh, these data and say, oh, this is representative of Shulnal, which is or, uh, one of the nearby sites, or El Aquiote. Um, but what we do see here is that fitting quite well with the, the sequence of, of, uh, of uh, Maya chronology, uh, we've got this period of, of a lot of disturbance through here. Um, within that, we look at magnetic susceptibility, as I mentioned, as a, a proxy for erosion. And we see uh, kind of uh, coherence with big peaks of magnetic susceptibility coming in where we see peaks of uh, disturbance indicators uh, in terms of the paleoecology. And then also, that's where we have the presence of uh, the corn pollen. And this is pretty early on. This is around 3,000 years ago. And so, you know, likely uh, caused by, uh, well, one major factor, I think, why we see so much more erosion early on. So you notice here, this is 2000 BP. This is a transition to the classic period. Uh, and there's far less erosion happening. And that's likely tied to the fact that when people first came into the area, there was a lot of soil developed. Uh, it hadn't really been disturbed uh, by humans, at least, in a way that would really open up the forest and allow for it to erode down uh, into the lake basins. Um, what was causing that opening? Um, you know, we don't know a ton about agricultural strategies um, in the area in terms of, uh, you know, Sweden or slash and burn versus more intensive methods like terracing or raised or ditched fields, um, especially that early on. But there was likely some Swidden agricultural happening. So we, we've got opening of the forest, possibly on the, the slopes around the lake uh, leading to that. I will say, I mentioned that LIDAR earlier. That is, again, blowing this wide open. Uh, people have been looking for evidence of uh, raised and ditched fields in the, in the low-lying bajos of the central part of the Yucatan Peninsula uh, for decades. And now it's, it's showing up quite clearly canals across the Bajos, terraces all over the place. Um, it's really, really exciting time to be interested in prehistoric Maya agricultural strategies. So this is one uh, possible cause of that, that erosion. We see a lot of disturbance and forest opening. The other thing I want to point out, this is again Terry Rutledge's uh, reconstruction of El Mirador, but um, you'll notice the city is basically paved in lime plaster, and that is not artistic license. Uh, out at Mirador, we have plaster floors that are decimeters thick uh, in sequences coming up from the uh, late pre-classic up through the late classic. Um, and that production of lime plaster had uh, 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 an impact or impacted the environment in a way um, that is often overlooked. Um, Tom Schreiner, who was actually an affiliate of ARF at one point, uh, did his, his dissertation uh, ethnographic research looking at uh, quantifying the amount of fuel wood needed to create uh, calcium hydroxide to get the quick lime. So everything was weighed all on the input side and everything was weighed on the output side. Um, and the, the punchline from his dissertation uh, was that something on the order of 1.6 square kilometers would have had to have been clear cut to pave El Tigre one time. And so um, it's unlikely they did that, but um, if you, if you think about the fuel wood needed to pave El Tigre one time and then consider that it has about five coats of plaster on it, and that's just one structure of hundreds, and all of the uh, water catchment um, uh, plastering that was done throughout the cities, um, the deforestation we see, these kind of low forest <coughs> values through here kind of come into more perspective, regardless of what type of agricultural strategies that we were, uh, uh, were being utilized at the time. Okay, so looking back at this uh, sequence of uh, uh, these pollen profiles here, we can, we can also see the, what looks like pretty clear evidence of uh, a decline in disturbance uh, near the lake. Um, notably here at the end of the classic period, this is very abrupt. This is the abandonment of the area, uh, permanent. We see no more corn through the rest of the record. Uh, no more weedy taxa, grasses drop off precipitously. Um, I think there's about 160 years between that data point and that one, so the forest bounced back amazingly quick. Um, we don't have the taxonomic resolution to know what sort of species difference there was from the pre-disturbance forest down here and what came back, but um, I, think I was pretty surprised to see this, and this is replicated across most of these sites. Um, 
But anyways, interestingly, we have some compelling evidence for abandonment at the late preclassic classic transition, which there's also archaeological evidence for uh, at El Mirador. A lot of those preclassic sites were abandoned at the end of the late preclassic. Um, you guys probably know more about this than I do, but I understand there's a lot of cultural transitions at the end of the middle preclassic moving into the uh, late preclassic in terms of pottery styles. Um, you know, the onset of the notion of divine kingship and these types of things. And so seeing what looks like another demographic decline and transition uh, right around that, um, that switch from middle to late preclassic as well uh, is, is an interesting find. So looking specifically at this classic to post-classic transition, uh, one of the things I've tried to do is to get very good age control on that and try to constrain the, again, that ecological signature uh, of settlement and abandonment across these sites. Um, and, and that's what we're looking at here. So this, this red shaded area shows from these three sites, basically uh, the last corn pollen present at Aguadazacatal up through the last one that I found at Laguna Yaloch. And the idea is to try to get at how <coughs> rapid this collapse was. Um, you know, with the archaeological record, we're looking at the last inscription that has happened to survive, right? And so that's fraught with obvious problems in terms of just preservation, um, in terms of piecing together uh, the sequence of abandonment uh, through the Maya lowlands. I'm not sure I've done much better here. We have about a 140 year period. Radiocarbon has its own ranges and you can't really uh, constrain it tightly. Uh, but again, we see uh, that very clear uh, decrease in grasses and increase in forest taxa coming right at uh, the, the, the last appearance of zea pollen uh, in the record. So again, this is that kind of signature of, the, of abandonment or classic period abandonment in the area. Okay, so turning to climate, which has been a hot topic in the Maya lowlands. So in 1995, Dave Hodel, uh, who was at the University of Florida at the time, published a paper in Nature, um, uh, got the cover of Nature uh, from a sediment core that he worked up in the northern Maya lowlands from Lake Chichancanab. And it's an isotope-based record also looking at uh, other precipitates and densities of precipitates in the record of gypsum. Um, but we're gonna just quickly kind of talk through how this isotope um, uh, work, uh, the model behind looking at isotopes and carbonates for, for uh, hydroclimate variability. Uh, so the basic idea is here, we got th kind of three main stable isotopes of oxygen, 16, 17, and 18. 016 is by far the most abundant, 99.9 something percent. Uh, so when we have a lot of precipitation and very little evaporation, it's the, the water, I should back up, this is a very simple, simple system. There are a lot of variables that can make this model very noisy. Um, some of them are, are minimized by the fact that we're down in the tropics and we can assume relatively stable temperature and relatively stable moisture source. Um, but so when we have a closed basin system uh, where evaporation is the prime mechanism for lowering lake level, uh, that's the idea behind, behind this model that we're working on here. So again, we've got a lot of precipitation, very low evaporation, um, kind of wet climate, uh, lake levels high. The ratio of O18 to O16 is going to be very low. So you have, uh, it's enriched in O16. So O16 is lighter. So when we have evaporation, that is preferentially evaporated out. And so as lake levels drop through evaporation, we see an increase or an enrichment of O18. And you can see the system is pushed even further here. Uh, the beauty is we can, we can look at carbon, any carbonate material has oxygen in it, and that's a snapshot of what the lake water ratios of uh, oxygen isotopes were at the time. So uh, we can look at fossil shell material and, uh, and, uh, and reconstruct hydroclimate variability to a certain degree using, using these techniques. So again, Puerto Arturo, we've got this 8,700-year uh, record, um, and, it, and it shows this nice sequence of we, we know uh, that because of the Earth-Sun relationships uh, uh, in this, um, the, this is called the thermal maximum in the northern hemisphere, um, this mid-Holocene period, uh, and that we would expect to see more moisture down here, and that's exactly what we see. So we see, again, we've got wetter um, conditions with the lighter values here and drier with the heavier values. So we've got this whole period of, of more moisture than, than what follows. Uh, and then starting around 6,200 years ago, we start seeing this trajectory towards drier conditions. So we've got this decreasing moisture. Um, interestingly, this is right when we see corn agricultural coming into the area. 
uh, through this whole period. So the late Holocene is characterized by these uh, relatively dry conditions. So one of the nice things about using a multi-proxy approach is from the same lake, you can produce uh, data sets to test your findings. And that's exactly what we did here. So I, I mentioned that, that um, shallow uh, delta in Lago Puerto Arturo that's currently, currently dominated by sedges. Well, what we've done here is ratioed the sedge pollen, Cyperaceae, with water lily pollen, which water lily prefers deeper water, two, three meters deep, gets its root down through that, uh, and also relatively clear water. And we, uh, if we think of that as a lake level proxy as well as our Delta 018, we can see that these actually track pretty well. So we, we can uh, essentially lean on this as a, as a pretty good um, lake level reconstruction, at least from Lago Puerto Arturo. I'm gonna put a really noisy diagram up here, but I think it's worth talking through. So this is uh, that same curve here in red is the Lago Puerto Arturo isotope curve. And what I've done is I've plotted it against uh, a sea surface temperature reconstruction from the Gulf of Mexico, where we have warm water penetrating in the loop current up into the Gulf of Mexico, where, again, if we've got a big warm pool in the Gulf of Mexico, we expect more precip, more moisture in the air. Um, similarly, in the Eastern Atlantic sea surface temperature reconstruction, warmer is wetter. You get more, basically just more loading of the atmosphere with water vapor. Um, uh, and so I'll talk about these two first. So what, what we see here is uh, really a, quite an amazing correlation. Neither of these uh, age uh, curves are tuned to the other. This is based on the original age model output from, uh, from the uh, original data sets. Very tight correlation with Mexico, Gulf of Mexico sea surface temperatures and Eastern Atlantic SSTs. And that all kind of plays into our understanding of synoptic climate drivers, uh, which is a big question. Uh, with, with the Maya area, what's driving climate variability. So early to mid Holocene, the Atlantic, there's a very tight coupling between lake level Puerto Arturo and sea surface temperatures across the tropical North Atlantic. And what we start seeing is around 4,000 to 3,500 or so years ago, uh, as the ITCZ starts to move south, I mentioned those Earth-Sun relationships with that thermal uh, maximum, the ITCC is, is moving south um, and what looks like happens at this point is we start to see more um, INSO activity. So, and this is played out across records that I'm working on in the Western US and, and others in terms of reconstructing the, the history of El Nino. Um, it looks like it really began expressing itself strongly as both El Ninos and La Ninas uh, in the late Holocene. So, you know, basically over the last 3,000 years. And so what it looks like in terms of um, bringing it back to the Maya world with the late pre-classic and classic period, um, we have much more of a Pacific influence and therefore increased variability. This INSO variability is, is much um, stronger and um, uh, higher frequency than climates from, from before. So this is again kind of showing that uh, around 3,500 years ago, we've got this uh, increased uh, Eastern tropical Pacific influence in terms of climate that's happening on the Yucatan Peninsula. So if we want to look at uh, the records of climate, uh, climate reconstructions, um, we can compare uh, across the entire Maya lowland. So this is the whole Yucatan Peninsula here. So again, this is Lago Puerto Arturo. This is only going back 3,000 years. Yaloch, another site that I worked on, had a very distinct band of carbonate precipitating out. Um, Punta Laguna and Chichan Canab are those lakes from the northern Yucatan Peninsula. This is Dave Hodel and Jason Curtis's uh, work that really kind of put these terminal classic droughts on the map. Um, Saab Nas is uh, Martin Elizalde, uh, Paleo uh, Speleothem reconstruction, and then Yak Balum. And we can see that uh, what started with this one record right here in 1995, uh, there is indeed evidence of drier conditions through this terminal classic period from you know, around 800 to 1000 AD. Um, the speleothems, the age control on them are much better than the radiocarbon dated lake sediments. And so these are really interesting. It's interesting to see that, uh, you know, this peak of dry conditions comes a little later than what we see elsewhere. Again, we're, as paleoclimatologists, we're really trying to rectify these to suss them out to see what these signals mean. Are they time synchronous? Are they reproducible? Um, you know, notably at Puerto Arturo, there isn't a, this isn't a, the biggest uh, dry indicator here at the, at the late classic period. Uh, and to me, that's, that's telling of the uh, variability just on the landscape with precip. 
I also highlighted a couple other, you know, I mentioned that uh, what looked like in the pollen record uh, demographic shift right here at the late pre-classic uh, classic transition. There's some, some evidence for drier conditions there. There's archaeological evidence as well up near Mirador. Uh, and then also just this uh, larger peak down here in the, in the middle pre-classic. Um, so we, again, we, we do have replicability in this terms of terminal classic droughts. Um, how much they played a role in the abandonment is, uh, it's difficult to say. Um, one of the things that I've looked at is the persistence of corn pollen at the sites that I've worked at at least, and the corn pollen is persistent through the peak of dry conditions that we see here, you know, up closer to, you know, 1,000 to, you know, 900 BP. Um, so people are there beyond these droughts. I don't know if we can say that perhaps the droughts were causing issues, you know, there may have been social breakdown or, you know, socioeconomic changes. Uh, and the corn pollen I'm seeing is just the last remnants of the last folks that hung around, or uh, perhaps um, you know things didn't really start breaking down until after the drought. It's difficult to say. Um, it is of, of interest to note that following the drought in nearly all the signals is a very dramatic, uh, not so much here, but shift to uh, extremely wet conditions. And so this is kind of where my mind is with this stuff right now, is that um, this is when the corn pollen falls out, is when you see this post multi-decadal droughts shifting to extremely wet conditions, and it might just be too much variability, right? These um, increased variability that we see in the, in the late Holocene that I was talking about. Um, so that's kind of where we are with climate. So I'm gonna dive into the world of Maya warfare here, which is not uh, something I know a ton about. This is all relatively new. Um, but as we've been developing a, 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 our most recent sediment core, we had this, this finding that kind of led me down this path. And, and uh, what I'm understanding and what I'm being told by the archaeologists that I'm working with is that very little is known about the reality of pre-Hispanic Maya warfare, right? So we have drawings that depict it. We know there are captives taken. Um, it's, you know, big school of thought that suggests that these were mostly, um, you know, small-scale raids or they were mostly focused on the elites. So most of the archaeological evidence that we have is tied to uh, the royal compounds or very rapidly built fortifications around the royal compounds. Um, you know, Arthur Demarest, again, has a lot of evidence from Ken Quinn and around the Petash Batun region showing... Um, massacres, essentially, of royals, of elites. Um, all of them dating to the Terminal Classic, you know, eight, post 800 uh, AD. Um, and that's led him to develop this, this kind of this idea that increased warfare, you know, may have played a role in the abandonment we see that uh, I think his model is mostly focused on, you know, as royal families grew and more and more princes were being anointed and they all each went and took their own little fiefdom that, you know, basically trade routes got tight, resources got tight, and uh, warfare basically increased. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, we've got epigraphic data. We have war statements, uh, which I'm going to touch on. But there's a handful from the classic period, from the late classic period. Uh, Pului is one, which means burning. Another one is chopping. Another one is entering. So there's a lot of um, epigraphic data that says, on this date, we entered that city. And so we know that a battle took place, but we really don't know much about what that means. Um, and so what we're going to look at here is uh, this tale of two cities of Huitzna and Naranjo. And so I uh, have been working at a lake near Huitzna. It's a, a, a classic period site. Um, it sits up on top. You can kind of see this, one of these big escarpments. You know, you see these trending escarpments in the in Paten. So it sits on the top of one of those escarpments. In fact, I think Huitzna means like mountain house or something. It's an amazing view from up there. You can just look out across this whole low-lying Bajo. So there's about a 100 meter escarpment. Um, this red line here shows the watershed for Laguna Econob. Uh, and Laguna Econob sits at the bottom of this very steep escarpment. And so all these uh, black dots are structures that Francisco uh, Stradabelli has mapped in. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the scenario we're looking at. And one of the reasons we targeted this lake was because it sits right at the base of the cliff uh, below Wheat's Na. And likely all of the sediment washing off that cliff is going to tell us the story of what happened up here uh, in, the, in the city. And so we got a seven meter core. That was the one I showed you guys earlier in those plastic tubes. And it turns out it has, uh, not surprisingly, an incredibly high accumulation rate. So this is how many uh, centimeters per year are accumulating. Um, 
you know, kind of th through, through the late classic, kind of peaking here in the late classic at greater than a centimeter and a half per year. And for comparison, Puerto Arturo, the range was 20 to 40 years per centimeter of sediment. So that was the resolution we could look at. Here we're diving in um, into a much higher resolution accumulation rate. And looking at the sediment itself, what, what we're looking at here is uh, influx of clay and influx of organic matter and carbon nitrogen uh, isotopes. So both of these are uh, what's washing into the lake uh, in basically uh, mass per unit area per unit time. So it's grams per centimeter square per year. And carbon nitrogen is a tool that we can use to look at what type of organic material is in the sediment. So heavier values indicate more terrigenous terrestrial plants and values of 10 and less indicate uh, algal blooms in the lake, right? And so most lakes, it's, it's somewhere along that spectrum. But what we can see is that during this classic period, uh, particularly during this peak of erosion that's coming in between 650 and 700 AD, that we have tons of erosion coming in, lots of activity, there's tons of corn pollen um, kind of pouring through there and uh, filling the lake up rapidly. So I mentioned we do charcoal reconstructions. Uh, and so this is our charcoal inflex curve for the entire 1700 year record from Eknob. And what stands out is this one peak right here at 700 AD. Uh, and it stands out not only because it's twice as large as any of the other peaks, uh, but the sediment itself was just loaded with massive pieces of charcoal, unlike anything I've seen in any lake I've worked on. Um, five millimeters long, you know, this is uh, from that level. This is what another level looks like, a typical level of charcoal where you are counting, you know, the entire cubic centimeter sediment and you might have, you know, 50 or 80 or 100 charcoal fragments. This is just loaded with charcoal. Um, and it's a three centimeter thick horizon of it. So it's just this massive deposition of charcoal that we happen to find a seed in. So we we're able to get a direct radiocarbon date from uh, 316 centimeters down. And so if we just calibrate that radiocarbon date, uh, the median probability is basically 710. Um, and when we plug it into our age model using CLAM, again, these kind of statistical age modeling tools I mentioned that really kind of, um, they take, uh, the fact that you've got an age below and an age above and helps constrain where the line's going to go through, through the probability distribution. Uh, CLAM kind of put this age at 693. So I'm looking at all these data. Here we have the abandonment, 700 AD. It's a little bit early for these terminal classic droughts. What's happening here? Well, Francisco and Alexandre um, Toko Vinine, who I mentioned is an epigrapher, we're out in 2016 excavating Wheat's Knot. And so they found uh, two stelae, and on stelae two, there was a nice clear emblem glyph uh, for Wheat's Knot. So we now know what the ancient Maya called Wheat's Knot, which was Balam Joel, which I think means jaguar ear. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but what's exciting about that, uh, along with the stelae, uh, they have excavated most of Wheat's Knot, at least the big monuments at Wheat's Knot, and all of them show signs of intense burning. So the Royal Palace, Francisco uh, notes, is basically the plaster is burned off the walls. It's the hottest fire he's seen inside a structure. They were just out there this summer excavating as far as they could to the east. There's a big watchtower up here, all of it. Uh, basically burned and not rebuilt. So uh, I understand there's some questions around um, ritual burning of structures when maybe another building phase is going to happen. And I think that that's something we're going to need to sort out. But I think what we're looking at is uh, likely um, the invasion of Huitzna by, by Noranjo. So I mentioned these war statements. Well, so it's not uncommon for there to be uh, emblem glyphs and place names on, uh, on stelae that nobody knows where they are because it's so rare to find an emblem glyph in the, t in the city or in the site that it's at. So as soon as we had Balam Joel in our pocket, um, uh, Alex has done a ton of work here, and he knew immediately that uh, you know, the king of Naranjo basically burn, uh, bragged about going in and burning Wheat's Na uh, on May 21st, 697 AD. So now we have, uh, for the first time ever, what we think is uh, a picture of what Pului looks like. So there's you know, literature on this where people are saying, well, the burning, it was probably, you know, maybe they burned the royal palace. Maybe it was this kind of ritualistic. They went in. It was a raid. Uh, they got some captives. And, um, 
Instead, what we think we're looking at is basically this is the charcoal curve up against that uh, erosion influx, the clay influx. This is the inflection point for, uh, for the decline there. So um, we start seeing things dropping off. Corn pollen is present uh, pretty consistently for another 100 years, but clearly there was a demographic shift. Things began to decline at, at 700 AD, at this burn horizon. Um, people persisted until I think corn pollen falls out of the record completely around 1000 AD. Um, and so this is interesting uh, evidence that perhaps these battles that we see these war statements for uh, were more widespread. They involved more of the population and had broader impacts than uh, uh, elites on elites and these battles uh, amongst the royal palaces. Um, you know, uh, I think the Maya have this long, uh, have been coming out of a long period. It started with the peaceful forest dwellers, and I think that it's been a long time kind of shaking the notion that they were out there kind of doing what people do, you know? Um, so uh, again, this is a really exciting find. We're kind of still putting the, the final uh, touches on what we think it means. Um, but we've got uh, what we think is the first, you know, very clear environmental uh, evidence for the impacts of a, a discrete event and a linking between the, uh, the sediment record, the paleo record, and, and the epigraphy. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to ask, right? A few minutes, maybe. Yeah. Um, is there any diatom work that you've done on the cores in that one that you'd like to talk to? Probably really reconfirm, not that you didn't, your tentacle data was pretty cool, but the diatoms uh, work that uh, so I've had uh, diatomists look for diatoms in these lakes, but because of the extremely basic nature of the, the water, they don't preserve well, which is a real shame. I, every time I get a new core, I send samples off hoping that they will be present, but it's really, they're really thin uh, and not, not very useful diagnostic. Excuse me, I'm not an archaeologist. What does CLAM stand for? CLAM is just the name for, I don't know what it stands for, if it's even an acronym, but it's, a, uh, it's an age modeling software. So you can basically input your raw radiocarbon dates uh, with the depths that they're found in, and CLAM will basically run several Monte Carlo uh, iterations through the entire string of radiocarbon dates and the probability associated with them. And you can have it go through 30,000 times and it will pick the most common path through the distributions of the radiocarbon dates. Um, Bacon is another one um, that's very useful where you can, uh, you can tell it, I have a stratigraphic break here. I have no reason to believe the sedimentation rate is the same above and below this break, so it allows some more freedom for how the line gets fit. But it's really bringing us forward with pinning down as much as we can the error that's associated with radiocarbon dates when we create these age depth models. Because, I mean, it's, it's the single most important thing. When you're looking at all of these changes, if you're kind of floating in time, it's frustrating. So it's, uh, it's moving forward. But to answer your question, I'm not sure exactly what CLAM stands for. <laughs> yeah? You know, today it's really clear that we have um, man-made climate change. Is there any evidence in No, that's actually a great question, and yes, there is. So what happens in this area, if you think about incoming solar radiation, uh, close ca canopy tropical force is very dark, and it's just going to absorb a lot of heat. And that heat is going to be you know, um, convecting and ra ra raising the air above the forest and causing precipitation. Clear cut the forest, or cut the forest, I should say, um, and have a lot of grasses come in, you've changed that albedo. You've changed the lightness of the surface. And a lot of that radiation is bouncing away, decreasing the heat, decreasing the convection potential. And yes, people, Ben Cook um, has, has modeled that. Uh, he's at, at NASA out in, uh, on the East Coast. Uh, attempted to quantify it. So looking at, OK, if we have large areas of very open uh, forest, rather than what was there before, 
one, you know, how does that affect the precipitation? And so he's, he's worked out some models looking at a very clear decrease in precip associated with that changing albedo with the vegetation. Um, and it's a fascinating thread, right? So we see corn coming in as things are getting drier. And so there's this kind of chicken or the egg thing. Um, you know, Roger Byrne was really big on looking at, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the droughts. I pointed this out. Things get very wet after those droughts. Too much precip in this area is also a big problem for prehistoric or pre-Hispanic agriculture. You know, you get a lot of uh, mold, you get pests, you get more weeds. If, if the dry season is shorter, you might not get a chance to burn your slash, you know. And so um, this idea that you see corn coming in and really spreading out pretty rapidly throughout the Yucatan Peninsula around 5,000 years ago, that's when we were coming out of that very moist thermal maximum. Um, but again, it's this chicken or the egg thing. Was it people came in and they started opening the forest and then, you know, at least with our discrete records, we're seeing that drying. Uh, it's likely, it's likely a combination of the two. But my feeling is those big, you know, the ITCZ moving south and those big changes in the synoptic patterns are really what drove it. And I think that the drier conditions of the late Holocene really kind of opened up and eased, uh, eased the ability to kind of penetrate into the forest. Yeah. Yeah, so corn, it has to be planted and tended to to grow. It's, if you've ever tried to grow it, it's like it needs the red carpet treatment. Fertilizer, weeding it, watering it. Um, so if it's, uh, it's unlikely that corn just kind of continue to grow in the fields after the fields were abandoned. To your point though, there's a possibility that, and this is another kind of unknown with palynology, that corn pollen may be reworked. So corn pollen could maybe be in the soils. We, this is where I am at with pollen analysis in general. How long does pollen live on the soil surface, or not live, how long can it persist on the soil surface? And so some of that might be material washing into the lake after the abandonment, maybe bringing in some pollen, um, but it's pretty unlikely. You can actually see uh, pollen's pretty fragile when it's not deposited and encased in the, in the sediment of a lake. And so it gets pretty beat up, it gets abraded. So if it does, if it is reworked and old, it, it has holes in it, you know, the fungus and stuff starts eating it. But um, so to your, your question, it's unlikely that, people, that it was kind of persisting on its own, but there's a chance that some of the pollen signal might be uh, kind of earlier stuff coming in later, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess, how, how do you account for the like, uh, travel of the sediments through the water column to their final location of deposition? Yeah, um, another great question. That's something we think about when we choose our coring location. So, so um, if you think, uh, you know, there's different types of morphologies of lakes, but uh, typically there's a deep point in the lake, and that's called the depot center. And more material is going to make it into that depot center. If it gets deposited on the slopes, it's going to come down. Uh, hopefully relatively quickly after it was initially deposited. And so you actually have a higher sedimentation rate in the deepest part of the lake because things this is called sediment focusing happens. Um, that's what we go for because uh, the higher the sedimentation rate, the, more, uh, the less years there are in a centimeter sample, the higher temporal resolution we have. But there are, you know, there are stream inputs that can be bringing charcoal. Charcoal can sit on the soils for thousands of years. So charcoal, um, has some pitfalls, right? So you could have a massive rainfall event if you're coring right by a, uh, a stream input. It could be bringing charcoal in from the, you know, that's been sitting around the soils for decades or centuries. Um, but yeah, ideally, and people do this when they're working on lakes that you can drive up to and hang out and camp for a couple of weeks, that you, you, you can actually quantify that and study it and put sediment traps out and pollen traps out and push it through a wet season and a dry season and see where the you know, diatom blooms are and where do the little carbonate critters grow. Um, those are all variables that are best constrained. Um, kind of hard when I've got two weeks <laughs> at the lake before my food runs out. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, the uh, short answer is, you know, we basically, you want to pick a site that's further away from direct stream input. I shoot for closed basin lakes because that simplifies that, uh, that hydrologic model greatly. Um, and then looking for the deeper part of the lake so you can kind of get the, the thickest sediment package. Well, let's say thank you again All right. for that.